Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. This is July 2021, and I'm your host, Sam Ashu. This month, we have a special interview with Dr. Daniel Egan. He is the co-author of the Emergency Medicine Practice article on managing the HIV-infected adult patient in the emergency department. And I can't wait for you to hear everything he has to teach us about our HIV-infected patients. Before we dive into that interview, I want to remind you of some exciting news. July is finally here, and this is the month we are expecting the debut of the EB Medicine mobile app. I have been looking forward to this for so long. I can't wait to have that entire volume of critical emergency medicine information at my fingertips while I am treating patients. It's searchable. It's on my phone. It's the entire article every month from both emergency medicine practice and pediatric emergency medicine practice with all of the diagrams, the tables, the flow charts. It is going to be amazing and I cannot wait for it to arrive. The month is finally here. If you are not already a pediatric emergency medicine practice and emergency medicine practice subscriber, this is the month to do it. So you can enjoy both of those publications on your mobile device. Go and subscribe now, ebmedicine.net. And now here is our special guest this month, Dr. Egan. So my name is Dan Egan, and I am the current program director at the Harvard-affiliated Emergency Medicine Residency Program, which is based out of Mass General Brigham in Boston, and uh, previously was in New York for a long time and, and have moved to Boston the last year. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us today on the podcast. You are the author or one of the authors for the July article in Emergency Medicine Practice titled Managing the HIV-Infected Adult Patient in the Emergency Department. And I'm looking forward to today's discussion and learning more about HIV. Before we start, you were actually a co-author on a similar topic back in 2016. Is that right? Yeah, you know, we did this article 2016, um, really kind of with the idea that the landscape of HIV is changing and that um, thankfully we're not seeing as many people with really advanced disease. And so that was the real motivation for, for the article then. And then kind of five years later, a lot has changed, mostly related to the pharmacology and, and some of the, the newer methods of prevention. And so we thought it was uh, timely to kind of reintroduce the topic and kind of give an update. Great. And now in 2021, things have changed. Uh, why did you choose now to, for, for the update? Yeah, it's a good question. I think... Um, the last couple of years, we've we've learned a lot, particularly as it relates to um, moving closer, I think, to ending the, ep the epidemic of HIV. And um, I think that in addition to kind of just managing and seeing these patients every day in the department, as we'll talk about, I think that emergency medicine actually is quite um, well poised to contribute to, to helping to end the epidemic, particularly for people who, who practice in areas where the disease is a little bit more prevalent. Yeah, so let's talk more about that. Why HIV in the emergency department? That's not something that typically comes to mind as one of the most frequent things we see in the ED. How relevant is HIV to the emergency setting? Yeah, you know, I think, um, so I guess it depends on what you're, what you're defining as, you know, kind of HIV. So certainly what we know is that there are a lot of people who are living with HIV infection. Um, the data is always a couple years behind in the CDC's sort of annual kind of numbers. Um, so the most recent data we have is from 2018, but there are 1.2 million people at least three years ago who are living with HIV and um, still continue to be a number of infections somewhere in the 30,000 to 40,000 range, probably now even. Um, although we hope that that's going down and we are seeing steady decreases in those numbers because of things like PrEP, which we'll talk about later. Um, but we know that based on some um, kind of larger epidemiologic modeling that people who are infected with HIV do go to the emergency department, um, maybe a little bit more often than those that are not HIV infected. And um, some of the NAMSES data, the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey, that kind of does modeling to generate national numbers, estimates that um, about six in a thousand ED visits in 2017 were made by someone who has HIV. So um, 
So it's something that people will see pretty frequently. Um, certainly that's a little bit skewed based on the demographic of where you work, um, but it's something that's that's prevalent in our population because now people are living normal life expectancies. So we'll see more and more people who are infected who present um, with all of the other things related to aging. Yeah, those are some significant numbers. Really, I did not realize that there were that many people in the U.S. living with HIV and certainly didn't realize there were that many new infections annually. No, I was just going to say, so I think if you, you know, if you actually look at graphs of this, it's interesting because what we're not seeing are people with AIDS, right? So the number of people living with AIDS is going down and the number of people dying from HIV is going down. But because life expectancy is increasing, there's this increase of people who are living with HIV, and that's really just because they're living longer. Um, so that number is going up. And hopefully the new infections will continue to go down, but we'll probably still have for a period of time um, the numbers of people who are living with the disease higher just because they're they're actually living, which is great. And that brings up an interesting point in the article talking about HIV in general is really kind of a cluster of disease processes. We've got the acute infection. We've got people living with chronic infection with or without compliance. And then you've got on the far end of the spectrum AIDS, which as you said, we don't tend to see as much anymore. What does acute infection look like for us in the emergency setting? Yeah. So um, basically acute infection is, is kind of this um, this constellation of symptoms that people get um, usually several weeks after um, or, or uh, you know, about two weeks or so after they're exposed to HIV and acquire HIV. Um, and it's really this syndrome, um, this viral syndrome, which seems and looks like a lot of the just run-of-the-mill viral syndromes that we see. Um, and so, you know, sometimes misdiagnosed or missed and just kind of given that sort of broad characterization that we often give of viral syndrome NOS kind of to patients when they present with vague symptoms. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I would say the, the take home points about um, the acute seroconversion illness is that people feel pretty sick. Um, they have high fevers. Many of them will seek care by a healthcare professional and, and a huge percentage of those will be in the emergency department because you know, based on where they are, oftentimes in urban settings or, or people who don't have great access to immediate primary care. Um, and they have a fever, they have a sore throat. Um, importantly, the, the pharyngitis is typically non-exudative. Um, they may have some GI symptoms. Um, there's a, a rash that's very nonspecific and just kind of looks like a viral exanthem that you'd see in a kid. Um, but I think the, the key takeaway is that it almost never, and of course in medicine, there's never a never, <laughs> but um, it almost never has any respiratory symptoms. And that's actually a really important branch point as you're working up or thinking about somebody who may have acute HIV is to, to see whether or not there are respiratory symptoms. And if there are, it's pretty much not going to be acute HIV. But if there are not respiratory symptoms, um, then my practice is to, I actually did this yesterday on shift, actually, um, a woman who had a fever, had a really bad pharyngitis without exudate, had a diffuse body rash, um, and had no respiratory symptoms at all. And so um, we talked about potential exposures to HIV, and she did have a new um, sexual partner in the last two months that she didn't really know and was not using barrier protection. And so um, we talked about the importance of and, and asked her permission to, to get an HIV test um, thankfully, it was negative, but um, it was just on the differential because she sort of fit the constellation of symptoms. Turned out she had mono. <laughs> I was actually just about to say, so this enters the realm of acute mononucleosis in presentation, but yeah. I like I like the, the, the pearl there that they have to have absence of respiratory symptoms because you're not going to get that from acute HIV. Yeah. You know, one of the first uh, studies that was done on acute HIV actually looked at, they took the serum that had been sent, um, at, I think actually the hospital where I work currently, but I don't recall it specifically, but they sent all of the labs, um, blood samples that were sent to the lab for mono, um, for a mono spot or whatever test, you know, you call it. And 1% of those had HIV viral loads over a hundred thousand. So it really is a mono like illness. Um, but with the key feature, the difference where mono typically has exudate, um, HIV pharyngitis does not. Um, but that's, so that's an important differentiating point. Yeah, and where we are now, hopefully trending out of the COVID pandemic in the U.S., there is a lot of overlap in symptoms with COVID 
uh, with the exception of the respiratory part. So that may be the only thing we could rely on there as a clinical differentiator before we go for testing. Yeah. And similarly, you know, in the in the time of year when influenza is more prevalent, although like we didn't see this year because of mask use, but that's also one of the, um, you know, the, the opportunities to miss it is sort of just saying it's flu, but um, really thinking about those potential cases where there's no respiratory stuff. So in your practice, if someone has this mono-like illness and you're going to send blood for anything, you're going to have this conversation with the patient about potential HIV testing. Yeah. I mean, at, at the minimum, I have a conversation about potential exposure in the last several weeks. Um, you know, if they're adamant that there has not been any exposure, um, most of them are like, fine. Yeah, you can say, send the test. I don't care. It's going to be negative. But um, usually do, do bring the topic up for those patients. All right. So that's acute infection. And then there is this entity of chronic infection. This is people living with HIV who don't have AIDS but they can be living with HIV for 10 or more years now when we can see them in the emergency department, right? Yeah, so I think the chronic infection is really the people who are undiagnosed, and that's really what we're, what we're talking about, um, or, or someone who potentially is diagnosed but not taking, not taking any meds. So the, the timeline as it maps out is people go through this acute seroconversion illness, and about 75 or, or 80% of people will go through that acute seroconversion illness. Um, and that lasts for a couple of weeks. And then basically people enter into this kind of clinical latency stage um, for eight to 10 years until their CD4 counts get low. Um, and so during that time, they might have just, you know, maybe more frequent colds or kind of URIs or something. But for the most part, they're pretty healthy. Um, but the HIV is in their body and it's replicating. And so, um, you know, when we talk about complications of chronic disease and this kind of chronic inflammatory state, and those are the individuals we're talking about who they've got this underlying brewing infection that's present and replicating that's causing an inflammatory response in their body. Um, but they're not symptomatic, quote unquote, from HIV per se, because they still have an intact immune system. Yeah. And this chronic inflammatory state becomes relevant for us in the emergency department as we see people with chronic HIV infection because now we're starting to understand that these patients are also at risk for multiple other chronic medical problems we would not normally associate with HIV, especially in people who seem too young to have those diseases, like coronary disease or COPD. You, know, you might see someone who's younger than your average patient who has known coronary disease come in with chest pain and eliciting this piece of information from their medical history now becomes quite relevant. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's there's been some back and forth in the data related to coronary artery disease. But, um, you know, I think a lot of the sort of meta analysis and stuff that we referenced in the in the article does does suggest that people who have long standing HIV are at risk for kind of earlier atherosclerotic disease. Um, and some of that may also be, um, you know, whether it's the disease itself or some of the lifestyle um, things that go along with or the social, you know, the modifiable risk factors that are present often concurrently, like increased risk of uh, rates of smoking, which is also probably partially contributing to COPD, um, but just the baseline underlying things. And it, and it does appear to have some prothrombotic component with higher rates of um, VTE in, in these patients as well. Yeah, that's an interesting one I hadn't heard before, but again, quite relevant to our practice is the increased risk for venous thromboembolism, so PE, DVT. What about patients who have been on medication and are compliant and have the normal CD4 counts and the very low viral loads or undetectable viral loads? They still have these risk factors or do those go away once the patient's been on medication and the disease is controlled? Yeah, I think probably um, what we're learning now um, is that like I think uh, some of the medications were thought initially to be contributing to some of the coronary artery disease stuff, particularly so, um, particularly the protease inhibitors, which are not as commonly used as people saw in the article. Um, but because of the dyslipidemia that was associated with that class of medications, and I think when we think about, um, you know, we think about the pictures of patients who were on meds, like with lipodystrophy and that fat redistribution, um, that was also altering their lipid profiles. And so, that was increasing the risk of coronary artery disease as a side effect of the medicine, 
So that particular one in patients who were on those for a long period of time may still be present. Um, but once people are well controlled and taking their medicines, then really it just becomes medication specific um, disease side effects kind of rather than the just chronic infectious state because they're pretty much for the most part when totally compliant undetectable and so the body's not reacting because there's no circulating virus present and now we're just dealing primarily with medication side effects. Now, when we talk about screening in the emergency department, you know, 20 years ago, this was a disease where we could potentially send a test, but patients were being referred out to talk to counselors and to discuss whether or not they're in the window for detectable disease. And there was repeat testing required. It had to be scheduled in advance. And it was just not something that was routinely done in the emergency department. And obviously, we live in a different time now testing has significantly improved. So we talked earlier about screening someone who comes in with mono-like illness. Are we asking about risk factors? Are we screening people based on risk assessments? Or are we just recommending everyone get tested at some point? What's what's the latest recommendation? Yeah, well, latest is not so late. Um, has it really been updated in a long time? Um, but, um, you know, there were some so certainly, basically, the CDC thinks that we should be having kind of universal screening for any adult who's having sexual activity. Um, you know, I think that's at least once a year is kind of the recommendation there. Um, but in terms of the emergency department, um, kind of initially, the discussions around testing were that people should think about kind of screening if your prevalence in the region where you practice is 0.1% of your population. Um, and so that's many people who work in larger urban areas. Um, and so the question then becomes, what do you do if you work in an area where there's not high prevalence of disease? Um, you do have obviously much less yield. Um, but what we do know is that people who are more likely to be infected are people who often are in more mi marginalized populations or um, there's certainly um, concerning trends in some of the um, minority communities in terms of uh, rates of disease. And, and those are people who, who we know often use the emergency department. So um, kind of universal screening is an approach, um, but it is, a, it, it is a lift on a department to think about incorporating that into their workflow. Um, and if you work in a place where the disease is not so prevalent, um, you know, you could argue that the, the cost benefit, uh, if that's how you're thinking about it, may not be huge. That being said, making the diagnosis is clearly changing that person's trajectory and their lifespan and also preventing them from infecting others, um, which is really, you know, we know that a significant, and as we, you know, we've looked at in the article, number of infections that take place are by people who are unaware of their diagnosis, which is really critical in terms of preventing the new, new disease is to identify infection. Um, so, you know, I think um, that's an important question for people to ask. And, and um, what I would say is there was a lot of resistance. I think of, we think of emergency departments as places to do emergencies, <laughs> um, to do resuscitation, to sort of diagnose acute illness and, and treat those things. And um, But I think this is an important role for emergency departments in, in trying to achieve this kind of end of the epidemic and in, in trying to, to find those 15% of people out there who are infected that don't know that they're infected. Um, who are responsible for a pretty significant portion of, of new transmissions. You know, I've read we, the table we have in the article, we talk about them being responsible for 38% of new infections. I've read numbers that suggest it's even as high as 50% in some things. And so um, they're responsible for a pretty significant part. Okay. So if we're going to adopt a risk-based screening in the emergency department, as opposed to just universal screening, say the, the prevalence in my community isn't as high as 0.1%, what are the risk factors we're looking to elicit in the history that are going to lead me to want to bring up HIV testing with the patient? Yeah, I think um, obviously sexual behavior is the, the largest cohort of, of risk transmission. And um, you know, I think we have to get really basic here and decide that just sexual activity without barrier protection is the risk, right? Regardless of population. Um, this is a disease that, you know, initially started in, in the population of men who have sex with men, but certainly has grown to include, um, you know, all populations. Um, 
We know that um, transgender women are particularly at high risk, particularly transgender women of color are very high risk um, population for acquisition of new disease. Um, certainly anyone who's sharing needles, um, people who, um, who inject drugs. Um, but, you know, I think thinking about just if you're sexually active and, you know, the unfortunate reality that we've all seen, um, you know, people, you know, I can tell you countless stories from, from years of doing this of people who thought that they were in relationships that were um, monogamous and unfortunately, ultimately, um, you know, their partner was not. And so it's a, it's a really tricky situation. And I think, you know, trying to find the high risk is not necessarily um, predictive. And so, um, but the things we know about are the things we just talked about. And so, you know, because of the other things is why with people engaged in routine primary care, you know, recommendations now include just kind of regular routine testing just to be complete, just because of the, you know, need to rely on someone else telling you the truth, basically, if you're in relationships. And when we now translate all of this into emergency department evaluation, if I'm sitting down at the bedside with the patient and having a conversation about this and I elicit from them that they have HIV, some of the things I'm supposed to pull out in that history that will be relevant to our evaluation would be what kinds of things? Yeah, the most important thing is really trying to get a sense of where where they are in the course of their disease. And so really that just comes down to um, three questions, I would say, is what's your CD4 count? Um, because we know that above 200 and below 200 is kind of this threshold for getting um, you know, more at risk for opportunistic infections. Um, what's your viral load, um, which really helps us get a sense of how well controlled their disease is. People can have um, very, uh, those two things are not necessarily 100%, um, meaning you could have a CD4 count that's still, that's pretty high, but have circulating virus. Um, or someone could be newly diagnosed and have a CD4 count of 20, but they could have an undetectable viral load because it's much quicker to eliminate the viral replication than it is to, to rebound your CD4 count. Though we don't have good predictive scores of what is this viral load equate to in terms of risk for a certain disease. All of that is really based on what the CD4 count is. Um, and then the last piece is um, about medication compliance so that you can have a sense of if they, you know, can tell you their last CD4 count was whatever number, 300, but I haven't taken my medication for five or six months, then obviously they're at risk for that dropping. Whereas if they say they've been 100% compliant, then their CD4 count should not have dropped and should hopefully have increased. Um, so those are the three kind of questions that I, I tend to ask people. And then when we move on to the physical exam, you did a great job in the article of actually breaking up the exam findings based on system, because there can be so many depending on the patient's status, whether or not they're medicated and compliant and what their current disease burden may be. So when before we get into that section, there's been some change in the actual HIV lab test itself. In the article, you talk about how we're we're now into the fourth generation of HIV testing. Why is that relevant? What's what's better about this latest generation of tests? Yeah. So basically, you know, for those of us that have been practicing for a long time, we all kind of remember in the initial stages of testing about this window period when a test would be negative, um, and what has what the advanced technology has done is allowed for the development of new testing, which is the fourth generation test. And the fourth generation test is one that has a combination of um, antigen and antibodies. So it's testing not just the antibodies that someone will develop um, against HIV, which is the rate limiting step in terms of that's what created the window period because it takes our body a period of time to develop antibodies that are measurable and identifiable in a blood test. Um, so the antigen is basically looking for the surface molecule of the virus circulating in the blood. And so it's doing both of these things. And so what that has done is really, really, really narrowed the time period um, in which someone would have a negative test, even potentially with, with virus circulating in their body. And so um, and that window is probably down to somewhere around two weeks with the fourth generation of testing, which is pretty amazing um, because that's a really small period of time. Um, and people, um, 
tend to start getting symptoms if they're going to get symptoms of acute seroconversion that we had mentioned about before. Usually the sort of most people have developed symptoms by day 11. Um, so sort of in that week to two week period of time. So the fourth generation test is considered the standard. The, the challenge is um, it is most in most places has to be done in the lab. Um, and some places are using kind of rapid testing with, with oral swabs, which is really easy to do and quick. Um, but those are third generation. And so that is looking for antibodies. So that does increase the window um, into the month range, month to two month range rather than a couple of weeks. So that's something someone could determine just by calling their lab and asking, hey, you know, we send serum down to the lab for testing. So the assumption is this is a fourth generation test. Is that correct? Or if you're working at a facility that's still doing the oral swabs, you could even inquire with your lab about procuring the fourth generation test because it would really narrow that window where you might miss the disease. Yeah, I would say that um, most hospital-based labs are going to be doing the combination test because all of the sort of CDC guidelines now are to start with that as the first line test. Like the thing, the Western blot of years ago is actually not even in the testing algorithms anymore. Um, so it really has, has really defaulted to the fourth generation. And in a lot of systems, when you actually order it, like in Epic, if you have Epic, uh, not that I have any alignment with Epic, but um, it actually says antigen slash antibody test, um, like in the actual order, having done this yesterday <laughs> um, for, for this woman who'd been sick for a couple of weeks. Um, and I guess the only piece I'll just add to that is that if you are highly suspicious that someone has an acute seroconversion, um, you know, and if you elicit from them that their risk of exposure was pretty recent, um, there is the small chance that the, the antigen antibody test will be negative if it's just a little bit too soon. And so in that situation, you do need to think about sending a viral load, um, which is actually going to PCR for the actual virus circulating in the blood um, and not just the, um, the antigen. And that's not a, a what we would call a real-time test in the emergency department. So you're going to send that off, but you're not going to get that information during your shift. Yeah, and, and frankly, that's... It's one that actually many hospital systems don't run routinely every day because it's um, it's just not a so a lot of them pull them and do them once or twice a week or something. And some places actually don't even do them on site and send them out to your city or state department of health. Um, and so if you are going to send that kind of test, you just have to be really sure that you've got the appropriate way to follow up on the result, whether that's your department follow up system, if that's what you do or that you're making a note yourself or something like that. And if you don't have the ability to do that, um, you know, be really careful because you don't want them to get lost to follow up um, and maybe just have a conversation with them about coming back to get a real HIV test or get their primary care doctor in a, in a week or two and not and to abstain from any um, risk behavior that might expose somebody else. All right, so let's switch gears for a second and then talk about some of the exam findings or or disease processes that can affect someone who is living with HIV. Uh, the first section you mentioned in your article was cardiovascular disease, and we touched on this a little bit with the increased risk uh, of in the pool data for coronary disease and secondary to chronic infection. So this is patients who might present with chest pain or classic ACS type symptoms, or are we specifically looking for things like congestive heart failure, uh, high output failure, what kind of presentation would they have in this system? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think like we talked about before, there is this association potentially with earlier um, coronary artery disease. And um, particularly if you get a history that someone had been on protease inhibitors for a long period of time. Um, but there is, um, there does appear to be um, a little bit of an increased risk of, of heart failure um, in, in patients who are HIV infected and um, you know, the one study that we quote in the article had about a 3% higher rate um, in patients with HIV compared to those without. Um, so um, again, I think we are good at identifying heart failure, but um, certainly in somebody who's coming in with, with shortness of breath, um, to, be, to have that on your differential um, in terms of um, a potential risk from longstanding infection. We mentioned earlier that pulmonary symptoms are not present in acute infection, but this is talking about the class of patients who have chronic infection. So they may present with shortness of breath or uh, a younger than average person with COPD or in a setting where you wouldn't have expected acute coronary syndrome and may prompt the discussion about HIV if they haven't already shared that they're 
on medication or have been HIV positive for a long time. Yep, exactly. And then from the pulmonary standpoint, we've all heard about uh, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia or PCP pneumonia. And that is a disease process we see at the really the, the very far end of HIV infection when the patient has AIDS. That's not something we would see in someone with controlled disease. Is that right? Correct. Yep. And um, yeah, so the, the classic cutoff is a CD4 count of uh, 200 as a risk for that. Um, just so people know, the name of this disease did actually change. It's no, no longer the cranii, but it's now um, pneumocystis gerovici. Um, but we still, people still say PCP, um, but technically um, the organism was re-identified. Um, but yeah, so a, a count less than 200 is really when people um, become at risk for that. Um, and, you know, the classic hallmarks of that are a non-productive cough with exertional hypoxia um, as sort of the, the symptom. And, and it can be very indolent for a period of time until people get really sick. And so, um, you know, not blowing off kind of the, the patient who has this lingering non-productive cough and maybe feeling a little bit short of breath. Um, and I always take the opportunity to just remind us all that it's not just people with HIV who get who get pneumocystis, but also people who are, you know, transplant patients or these other things who are on longstanding steroids and other immunosuppressives who um, are at risk for these just atypical organisms because of that. And in that setting, the lactate dehydrogenase or LDH is typically elevated and is a, a part of the screening tests that are sent to determine if someone has pneumocystis pneumonia. Is that right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a very sensitive test. So if it's normal, it's probably not um, pneumocystis. It's not specific to pneumocystis, but um, depending on where you are and what level of technology is available and whether someone's going to get bronched or not, um, sometimes treatment is initiated with a classic x-ray and an elevated LDH and a, and a known count that's low just based on the, the presence of the elevated LDH. And with the elevated LDH, some of the other disease processes that the patient might be suffering from include things like tuberculosis and toxoplasmosis or lymphoma, really all the things that someone with AIDS would be susceptible to. Right, exactly. Perfect. And then renal disease. So people who are living with HIV and are on medications are susceptible to kidney stones, nephrolithiasis, urolithiasis, and, and this can be a, a commonly presenting complaint. Yeah, I would say it's common only for people who are taking protease inhibitors. And um, increasingly, protease inhibitors are not part of the, the traditional uh, regimen with people more likely being on integrase inhibitors plus the nucleoside or nucleotide reverse uh, transcriptase inhibitors. Um, and so, um, you know, I think we, for years and years and years, the question on all the boards was always indinavir, patients on indinavir, and they come in with flank pain and there's nothing on their scan. That's the kind of classic, um, but very few people take that medication right now. Um, but sometimes um, uh, atazanavir, uh, ataz um, is one that is still used a little bit um, and can cause these stones that are not um, seen because they're radiolucent. And so you just see the secondary effects. Um, I think in terms of renal stuff, the more common thing to worry about is just um, the nephrotoxicity of some of the medications that are longstanding, um, particularly uh, tenofovir when it's the tenofovir uh, disoproxyl uh, formulation. Um, and so patients who are on these medications, including those that are taking uh, that one with PrEP, um, will get routine creatinine measurements just to be sure that their creatinine is normal and not, and not changing. And then when it comes to neurological diseases, what kinds of presentations are our patients susceptible to? The same way that we worry about uh, infectious etiology as people's CD4 count is getting lower and lower, then they get at risk for central nervous system infections like cryptococcal meningitis um, or um, tuberculosis in the brain, um, PML, things like that, that we don't see very often. Um, you know, in the same category of this kind of accelerated cardiovascular disease, there's some question about whether or not we might see earlier development of that in people who are, have longstanding infection that are not, that are not taking uh, in medicines, toxoplasmosis, um, as the CD4 account drops. But um, for the most part, patients who are taking you know, their meds and, and are immunocompetent 
are not going to have any different diseases than what we would see every day. Um, you know, there is some longstanding um, risk of HIV dementia, um, this hand uh, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder uh, syndrome that's described. Uh, that seems to be more related to uncontrolled disease. And for a little while, um, the last time we wrote this paper, actually, we were, it wasn't as clear that it was um, that it went away even without uh, when people were compliant. But it seems like now with better control and de decreasing viral load um, that people really are not developing the, the dementia effects as much as they were. Good. And that's something we can actually mention to patients if they're not compliant with their medication. Yet one more reason to yeah. take your medications, one more disease we can prevent. Yep, definitely. On the GI side, diarrhea is a very common complaint. And obviously, we see that in the emergency department quite frequently. But most of the time, it's viral uh, or something related to a food exposure, anything different we need to think about with our chronic HIV patients? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, with chronic disease, certainly as the disease progresses, there's HIV enteropathy. Um, there's you know, malabsorption syndrome just from the chronic inflammation in the gut. Um, so diarrhea becomes a very common symptom in those patients. Um, I would say that the, the place to think about this is as, you know, there's no way we're going to remember all the side effects of all the different meds. But if you look at the table in the article, diarrhea and GI stuff is a common side effect of medications. And so certainly for people who have just initiated their medication, um, they may present with, with diarrhea as a, as a new symptom that's causing them discomfort or um, it's frustrating. Uh, but oftentimes after they're on the meds for a period of time, it will resolve as their body adjusts to it. But um, in the new time of starting a medicine. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, um, again, a lot of the stuff is is challenging because a lot of the data that sort of is linked with the disease is, is before undetectable patients were more common than not. So C. diff was something to always think about as something um, that is more common in HIV infected individuals than not in HIV infected individuals. So, you know, I would be careful in patients who've got the traditional risk factors for that plus HIV, um, you know, that they're going to have um, potentially more high risk for that. And, um, you know, and then I think we just we also always have to be aware that patients with HIV are at high risk for co-infection with with the hepatitis, and so thinking about hepatitis C and hepatitis B, um, depending on the risk profile, um, as co-infection uh, of someone who is who is HIV infected if they're still continuing to engage in high risk behavior, um, and so ensuring that we're taking adequate histories if someone's presenting with an acute transaminitis or something like that. Yeah, and one of the interesting points that was made in the article was that some of these antiretroviral agents actually have activity against hepatitis B. And yeah. so someone who has discontinued their medication who has hepatitis B may actually see reactivation of that infection in the acute phase. Yeah, exactly. Um yeah, so if they've been under well control, as we know now, we've got you know curative treatment for hepatitis C, but we don't have that for hepatitis B. Um, but some of these antiviral agents are used in the treatment of hepatitis B, and so sub, you know if someone is suddenly non-compliant for whatever reason and not taking their medicine anymore, they can have an acute hepatitis as just reactivation of the virus um, and can be and can present quite ill from that. Now, for the hematologic disease, most of this is related to people who are not compliant with medication and demonstrate the thrombocytopenias or anemias or even pancytopenia, but there is a subset of people who have venous thromboembolism complications. Those are people who are on medication or people who are non-compliant or unmedicated? Yeah, I would say that um, it's definitely in the people who are not on, on medication. Um, but, um, you know, there is some, it, it seems like the more recent data suggests that it is associated with people who have more poorly controlled disease as their primary risk factor. Um, so I would say that that's really the population to be thinking about this in. I would say the patients who are compliant with well-controlled disease um, are probably less, are, are, are at the same risk as the rest of the population. Um, unless there's something related to one of the medicines. Um, but really the, the, um, the data on that is direct correlation of the medications to venous thromboembolism disease is not as clear 
as that from those who are not compliant with medicine or, or have poorly controlled disease. A couple more systems. So endocrine, I don't typically correlate HIV and endocrine disease at all in my brain. I was surprised to read this entire section and to learn about all of the different ways that your endocrine system is affected, not just by HIV infection, but also as a side effect of many of the medications that someone has to take. So something we still need to be aware of, lots of things in this in this section Where do you think this fits into the emergency department presentation for most HIV patients? Yeah, I would say that um, it's more about, this is less likely to be an acute presentation, I think, for us. I think these are more of the chronic side effects of patients who are, um, you know, and and I think before I had said protease inhibitors with lipodystry, but that's more of the NRTIs. um, And protease inhibitors do have uh, uh, effects on glucose metabolism. And so... Um, you know, I think it's unlikely that we're going to see kind of acute emergencies. Uh, however, patients who are on these, you know, medicines that may alter their lipid profile or create insulin and glucose resistance and things um, may be presenting with, with those manifestations. Um, but I think for us, it's really about treating the condition they present with and sort of letting their HIV primary care specialist figure out now afterwards if they need to have modification of their, you know, medication profile, um, since they've got these side effects as a, as a, um, as it relates to it. And then the last two I want to touch on real quickly. So psychiatric disease is becoming a, a significant system affected by HIV, both in the medicated and unmedicated population. And this we see a lot of in the emergency department. Yeah. I would say that I think there's a lot of, um, concomitant, mental health disorder in patients who are HIV infected for reasons that wouldn't be surprising to anyone. Um, having a chronic disease like this um, can, is life altering for people. Um, it changes many of um, the things of their day-to-day life and they've got medications to take. Um, they have some modification of behavior. Um, and so there's, there's all of that. There's, there's, you know, in some populations, higher incidence of substance. Um, and so, you know, uh, substance use disorder at the same time is, is also um, a problem which can contribute to, um, you know, and would be classified into under the psychiatric disease, I think. Um, and, um, you know, I think patients with HIV are at risk for, for depression. Um, this, this demoralization syndrome is, is described, which is, um, it's kind of uh, having a lot of similar symptoms to depression, but without the sort of kind of um, larger hopelessness that we often think about in the, in the characteristics patients with depression. Um, so I think, um, you know, not surprising to me, uh, not uh, infrequently, the patients that I see in our area of the department who have behavioral health issues or substance use disorder are, you know, sometimes also infected with HIV. And so, um, you know, just knowing that this does put them at a little bit of increased risk. Exactly. And for the last system, the the dermatologic findings, we know the classic ones associated with AIDS, but there are others, uh, especially associated with even medications that can lead to noncompliance, uh, photosensitivity, you mentioned dermatologic hypersensitivity, all of these things can contribute to reasons why patients don't want to take the medication. Is that right? Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's there's there are people who specialize you know, if you if you work at a hospital that's got an HIV center or clinic, they have dermatologists who just work in their HIV clinic because it's just, you know, so many different manifestations in the skin um, related to both the disease and then also some of these medication side effects. And so, um, you know, I think the life threats are things that we're going to recognize, right? That, um, you know, the rare cases of Stevens Johnson's or something like that. Um, and but some of these other sort of nondescript seborrhea keratoses and and other rashes that people will get, um, which may not have an acute emergency component, but you know for us to be aware that hey this could be something that's related to your HIV meds, it's important now to get follow up with your doctor to kind of talk about that because potentially changing your meds may help some of these conditions, and so sort of giving them that that because um, our goal is to maintain compliance, we don't want people to stop taking their meds Um, because that's when things go awry. And so um, letting them know that there are other treatment options, there's lots of treatment options today. And so um, 
in getting them back in to see their their provider who's giving them their HIV meds um, to, to potentially change something if it is a medication side effect. Yes, yeah, so many things associated with management of this as a chronic disease, much like any other, that it almost becomes a specialty uh, unto itself with all of the different diseases and all of the different systems of the body that can be affected. If you haven't already looked at this article and you're listening, I highly encourage you to go and look through table one, which lists the common antiretroviral medications and all of their potential adverse effects. It's quite extensive. And I think you'd be surprised with the number of things that might bother someone who has HIV and has to take these medications. And the the variation of presentations is almost dizzying, really. There's so many uh, that, that HIV seems like a relevant differential diagnosis for just about any presentation we see in the emergency department. Uh, and certainly, if we elicit that history from someone and they're coming in with any complaint, it could be related to their medication, it seems, from looking at all the possibilities in that table. Yeah. The, the only other thing that I would just add to that is just related to the medicines, which are so complicated. And even, you know, for me, who has an interest in this area, I can't keep track of all the different ones and all the different types. Um, but they, you know, there are a number of them and there are a lot of interactions. And so, you know, definitely as we start thinking about prescribing things like antibiotics and other things for these patients, just to be sure that it's not on some of these, you know, high grade interaction lists. Um, since some of these do work through the P450 system and other things like that. And then lastly, there are some special circumstances mentioned at the end of the article that I'd like to touch on. So we, we're familiar, if you're working in an emergency department, you're familiar with post-exposure prophylaxis, both for occupational and non-occupational use. And there is now an entity called pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this is people who... Uh, either have a partner or are engaging in activity that is exposing them to HIV on a regular basis, taking a prophylactic antiretroviral medication. In this population of patients, if they present to the emergency department, even with, say, an unrelated complaint, is it still recommended that we screen them or just note that they're taking these medications and keep in mind that they may have side effects? Yeah, so um, this is... Uh... You know, some of the, I would say, one of the more exciting things in, in the sort of world of controlling HIV spread is that the pre-exposure prophylaxis really seems to work. Um, it's not 100%, but it's pretty close to 100%. Um, and um, initially was was evaluated in populations um, in Africa and in, uh, in serodiscordant relationships. Um, and seem to be effective um, and now has been expanded and studied in many other populations. And um, so I would say that um, most people in order to be on PrEP um, have to be engaged with a provider who's doing routine screening. There's Q3 month testing um, and screening for all STIs that's required to be um, to continue to be on the medicine. And so um, they're usually engaged really well in, in screening. And so, um, you know, I, I think those people are engaged with providers and getting routine access to the screening for not just HIV, but to, to for all STIs, um, usually on an every three month basis, but at min, at, um, in some cases, I guess every six months, but the standard is really every three months. Um, so it's really, it really works. Um, and then in terms of post-exposure prophylaxis, the only thing I would say is that there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of people's hospitals and protocols outside of the occupational setting. I think it's really sort of rote at this point and people are really used to this, what to do for needle sticks. But um, surprisingly, if you look at the literature on this, there's a lot of places that are still not great about doing it for non-occupational exposures. Um, but we do know that initiation of PEP within 36 hours and particularly within the first two hours after exposure is highly, highly effective um, at preventing uh, HIV acquisition when it's taken for the full 28 days. And so um, we just really encourage, you know, our colleagues around um, that if you do see these patients and getting them at least the first dose of medicine as quickly as you can, and then you kind of figure out the rest after that, but um, it is really effective. And the sooner they get exposed to these medicines, the, the less likely they are. Um, the, the only data we have, which we'll never see a randomized trial um, 
was from a long time ago, and it showed that just giving one medicine, which was AZT, which we don't even use anymore, um, for PEP decreased um, rates of, of getting HIV by 88%. And now we give three drugs, and um, they're much better drugs. And so it's probably way higher, you know, and in animal models may even be 100%, but um, nothing's ever 100%. But um, so, I, you know, the data is really, really good. And so, um, you know, we should, we should really be thinking about this and making sure we're doing it uh, if people are exposed or potentially exposed. So one of the problems, not surprisingly, in the emergency department is outpatient follow-up. And in the case of post-exposure prophylaxis that is not occupational, when you're prescribing post-exposure prophylaxis or the PEP and you're giving them a prescription for the full 28 days, or, or are you trying to arrange for them to have outpatient follow-up to then continue the rest of their 28-day regimen? What's, uh, what's your common practice? Yeah, so most of the time, um, it is about giving somebody a starter pack of meds to get through the first couple of days and then to try to link them with someone who can do the full, the rest of the 28 days. Um, that being said, I know that that's not a reality for a lot of people who work in places where um, you may not have access to many providers who, who can do that. Um, so I think that becomes a little bit of a decision <laughs> for the EM provider on whether or not you're comfortable giving somebody 28 days of, of these medicines. And I would say for the most part, they're pretty safe. And the likelihood that something will happen to someone, you know, in terms of renal function or something is pretty low. Um, that's really, you know, the standard is that they get labs checked at two weeks and then at the completion um, and really just monitor for signs of acute seroconversion, in which case they should see somebody. Um, so I think it's probably safe. I think, you know, my, I'm very comfortable with these things. So I think that if I were practicing in a place where I didn't have somebody that I could refer them to the next week, um, then I would probably give them the 28 day course. But, um, you know, the current, you know, there's state by state guidelines in this. So I can't speak to what everybody's guidelines are, um, you know, I would say where I practiced the longest point in my career in New York, it was recommended to give people a starter pack of a week um, and then get them in to see somebody after that from the ED. Um, and we, you know, worked hard to build kind of referral processes for that. Um, but if you can't, you can't, you can think about doing the 28 day course because it really is important for them to get the full 28 days for it to be effective. And this really is a conversation that can occur with the patient. There can be some decision making back and forth, as you say, you know, in an ideal scenario, you would follow up with X in five to seven days because you need your renal function monitor, you need repeat HIV testing, you need to make sure you're not having side effects from these medications, we need to make sure you don't have an acute HIV illness, and that you're otherwise doing well, but... You know, if there's absolutely no way that's going to happen, or if there's a question about it, you know, or you know, maybe I'm just going to write you the prescription for the tw the full 28 days, and we both have an understanding that ideally you would have this follow up, and we just have that discussion up front and are a little bit more honest about it. I think that's a a, a reasonable way to go as well, and say, uh, this is how I would like this to unfold, but I'm giving you the prescription for the full 28 days because it may not occur. Yep, I love that totally. Fantastic. Anything else that we didn't mention that you want to drop a quick pearl on? <laughs> um, yeah, I think the only thing we didn't mention, which I think is not necessarily directly relevant to emergency medicine practice, but I think really important for us all to know, is um, which we mentioned in the article just about this idea that if someone is undetectable, then they are untransmittable. I think that's a really important public health message that there have been no cases of someone with undetectable viral load transmitting HIV to someone else. Um, and that's really the way to stop this, is that if we get everybody diagnosed and then get them into treatment and get them undetectable, then they're not gonna transmit the infection. But um, really, really important messaging of the importance of taking medicine, because once someone really does get to undetectable, it says U equals U, um, you know, model that's been presented that they are not able to transmit the virus to others, which is really amazing. Um, and really, I think the sort of light at the end of the tunnel in terms of ending the epidemic. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast today and for co-authoring this article and sharing your knowledge with us. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for the July 2021 episode of Amplify. Thank you so much for joining us this month. And I sincerely hope that you enjoy the conversation with Dr. Egan 
such a wonderful guest and so many good pearls about HIV-infected patients in our emergency departments. Don't forget that this month brings us the EB Medicine mobile app. So again, if you're not a subscriber, go to ebmedicine.net. Take advantage of the discounts available to you, the volumes of CME, and enjoy having all of that information at your fingertips on your mobile device starting this month. Until next time, I'm your host, Sam Eshoo. Be safe.